Leading off our discussion now, John Heilman, National Affairs Analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He's co-host and executive producer of Showtime's The Circus. Also joining us is Ezra Klein, editor-at-large at Vox and the host of the podcast, The Ezra Klein Show. And Kimberly Atkins, Washington Bureau Chief for the Boston Herald and an MSNBC contributor. And Ezra, let me start with you tonight. I, what I'm watching in the Oval Office, for the most part, uh, with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, is the old method. Uh, they, they are stepping up their game in a certain way and interrupting Donald Trump and playing to the cameras like Donald Trump is. Uh, but they seem to think that it's going to be a serious meeting in the Oval Office. And so we have to stay serious and present our serious position all the way through here. And one of the reasons they don't want to bring up Mexico will pay for the wall is they know how ridiculous it is and they don't want those ridiculous words uh, to come out of their mouths. But it seems to me there's still room for them to figure out how to deal with Donald Trump in one of these meetings that turns out to be a circus. I do think that they did a nice job, uh, to, to give them some credit here, of putting him in a corner. What struck me so deeply about that meeting was that Donald Trump doesn't himself want the wall. That is not the meeting you hold if you want the wall. The difference in what he wants in funding and what he's currently got in funding is about $3.7 billion. I mean, Lawrence, you know federal budgets. That is nothing in the federal budget. If he wanted that wall, he would not have put that meeting in front of the cameras, which is something they kept saying, and he'd be willing to give them something for it. Dreamers uh, protections would be a very, very easy trade. It would actually, in fact, be a popular trade for him to make and probably even for them to make. But the thing about Trump is he doesn't want the wall. He wants the fight over the wall. And that's where I think you're right. I don't think they know exactly what to do with a president who doesn't want his policies because he doesn't care about policy. What he wants to do is have fights with Democrats about policy or about policy ideas or about words that sound like policy ideas and have those fights on camera. Um, the fact that those fights don't rebound well for him, the fact that it's not at all obvious that he's in a popular position doesn't really seem to bother him. His Trump runs his presidency as if the question is whether the ratings in the television show he's starring on are good, whether the plot twists are interesting. And today was a good day in the Trump show. But if you're somebody who actually believes in Donald Trump's vision for America, it was a terrible day. It was a day when you saw that he has no interest at all in negotiating to get that vision done. Uh, Kimberly Atkins, uh, Eli Stokel is reporting tonight that uh, Trump stormed out of the Oval Office right after the Pelosi-Schumer meeting ended, uh, flicking away a folder and scattering briefing materials in frustration, said one staffer who saw it. And so, uh, Kimberly, according to one leaking staffer, in the White House, Donald Trump was not at all pleased with the way things went. And I, I can't really blame him. <laughs> I mean, I, I, we're talking about how uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, uh, what they're used to dealing with in the White House. But what struck me was that President Trump, for the first two years of his presidency, have been used to leaders in the House and the Senate who uh, at best ignore what he's doing uh, and at worst capitulate to some of his own worst instincts. They've never stood up to him. They've never really pushed back against him. And now he's facing uh, Nancy Pelosi, who's about to take the gavel of the speakership. And I think he's beginning to understand, both in messaging and on policy, that she is going to be a very different speaker uh, than Paul Ryan was, that she is somebody who will stand up to him. Uh, she was trying to uh, show some decorum in the White House saying several times that this was a discussion that perhaps should be held off camera. But when Donald Trump took a swipe at her uh, about the speakership battle that she's uh, having right now, she made it pretty clear that she's not the one, that she's not the one to be messed with and advised him not to do that. And so I think what we saw is the beginning of what could be a, a, a roller coaster ride of a relationship between Donald Trump uh, as he finally stands, you know, faces someone uh, who can stand in the way of his policy, who can push back, and who is going to lead an effort to try to hold him accountable in a way that he hasn't been for two years. Uh, John Heilman, the Associated Press is reporting that Donald Trump did say in the closed door version of the meeting, yeah. Mexico will pay for the wall one way or the other. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was shocked by that. And then Trump told the lie that uh, in the new version of NAFTA, you know, the, the, the money will be used to pay for the wall. He doesn't understand that the American government collects no money right. in the new uh, version of NAFTA or in the old version of NAFTA. It's not the way it works. Eli Stokel is reporting this uh, about 
about uh, the meeting, the closed door session. He says, am told very little of substance took place yeah. after the pool cameras were finally There's ushered out. Once the president has been aggravated to that level, there's no coming back from that and refocusing, according to the source who leaked about the meeting. I generally have a lot of sympathy for your, uh, your the prism through which you view Trump, which is through the prism of a pathological liar. And then you you take that as the as, as the most fundamental thing about him and then try to figure out what your strategy and tactics are based on that. The soul and I think it may be a, a, a fatal flaw in your perspective, is that Trump lies to himself as much as he oh, lies yeah. to everyone sure. else. Sure. And so that lie, lying to yourself at that level turns into a delusion, mm -hmm. right? So the thing about Mexico, he, you could confront him with his own words about Mexico paying for the, for the wall, and you imagine he would say on camera exactly what he said in the private session, which is he would just yell at you more about how, of course, Mexico is eventually somehow going to pay for the wall. Mm -hmm. The delusions of the man were on display in, to an extraordinary degree here today. The, the, the lie that he tells himself that he's a better negotiator than everyone else when it's clear now that he's not just a bad negotiator but the worst negotiator yeah. and we're going to see that play out that yeah. played out today the lie <laughs> that he's better on television in a, in a, in a, he, if he forces a couple people who aren't used to the reality TV milieu into an unexpected televised confrontation that he'll get the better of them. Again, you learn very quickly. Trump is in, is in cloud cuckoo land about his own abilities as a television performer in these settings because he got outplayed completely by Pelosi and Schumer. And the final thing that I thought was incredible today was he still seems to really believe. There's a moment where you could tell he's being really earnest with Nancy Pelosi saying, we won the Senate, Nancy. We won the Senate. Mm -hmm. And you wanted her to look at him and you'd say, you know, you had the Senate. You didn't win the Senate. Mm -hmm. You had the Senate. You picked up a couple seats in the mm -hmm. most forbidding climate for Democrats in 100 years. You failed in every respect in the midterms. How can you be clinging to this notion that somehow, well, you won the House and we won the Senate? The man truly, though, believes that. And all of those delusions, I think, what we learn today is are going to cause him a lot of problems in the coming next two years. Yeah. Uh, let's listen to uh, if we stay with the the Mueller uh, uh, example of this and, and consider what was going on in the Oval office, Donald Trump testifying uh, about his crimes, and he eventually confesses that he wants to shut down the government and commit that crime against government. Let's listen to the Trump defense lawyer whose job was to speak after Donald Trump today. That role was played by Mitch McConnell. Let's listen to how the Trump defense lawyer tried to clean this up. Well, I hope that's not where we end up. I understand it was a rather spirited meeting. Uh, we all watched. Um, but I'd still like to see a, a smooth ending here, and I haven't given up hope that that's what we'll have. So Ezra Klein, if Mitch McConnell wants a smooth ending, Chuck Schumer wants a smooth ending, Nancy Pelosi wants a smooth ending, there's going to be a smooth ending, right? It's like Fight Club. The first rule of shutting down the government is you don't talk about shutting down the government. You never talk about shutting down the government. You never want to be the person shutting down the government. There's this moment in the meeting today where you can just tell, I, I think you actually played the clip earlier, that Schumer cannot believe, he cannot yeah. believe he's just gotten Donald Trump to say, I will shut down the government. That will be all me. The thing presidents typically do after they lose a midterm is they back off a little bit. They try to moderate in between um, a new opposition Congress and their own party. They try to move a little bit to the middle, um, and they try to negotiate, and they try to show that the party that just came in, the party that just won the midterm, will stop at nothing, including shutting down the government, to stop their agenda. What they want to do is show that they're on the side of the country, they the president, and this new you know, House majority or whatever it might be is on the side of some narrow partisan agenda. What you don't do is turn around and say, I, the president, will stop at nothing on my agenda. I will shut down the government. I will try to get something after an election in which I lost the election. And by the way, in the Senate, they lost the popular vote in the Senate very, very, very badly. He did not win the Senate in terms of popular opinion. He, they had a good map. Um, it's a bizarre performance. And at, at that moment, and I think you see it with McConnell there too, they. Like, Schumer and Pelosi cannot believe what Donald Trump has just said and the negotiating position he's just put himself in. And McConnell now also cannot believe the negotiating position Trump has just put him in. Because now if there was a shutdown, there is no way for McConnell, no way to do exactly what he would want to do and what he maybe would have profited from doing, which is blame it on the Democrats. Uh, I'm sure he'll do it anyway if, the, if it comes to that. Uh, Kimberly, the polling on this, on the wall, uh, could not be clearer. 50% uh, say it's not a priority at all. 
uh, only 19, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 28 percent, which is, you know, Trump world, uh, say it's an immediate priority. Uh, the, 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 the public is with the Schumer-Pelosi side of this argument. Yes, but this is one of those things that the president keeps going back to. Uh, I, I call them the crowd pleasers, right? The things that he says at rallies, usually, that he knows gins up his crowd, that he sees it as a rallying cry. It's akin to lock her up. And I think he knows it's not going to happen, but he keeps going back to it. What was surprising was how much he went to it during this meeting. I, I checked the White House transcript, and he said the word wall 45 times. <laughs> which is which is what I believe Nancy Pelosi later said, you know, was talking about his obsession with it and, and thought that it was perhaps a manhood thing. It's a part of his identity now. It's something uh, that transcends a policy. And I think going into this meeting, I thought one of two things could happen, given uh, the Mueller investigation, given the uh, roller coaster of the stock markets and, and the problem finding a chief of staff. Donald Trump could either go in this trying to negotiate a deal in order to get a win and to change the subject of the headlines, or he would be so frustrated by all those things that he would go in, uh, you know, with a, with a terrible disposition and lash out. And it looks like he did the latter, uh, and it didn't work out for him too well. I mean, I think he, he missed uh, even when, when Chuck Schumer was trolling him a little bit about that, what he said about winning the Senate. I, I don't think he even caught it. Uh, he just was not on his game, uh, but he retreated to the place where he's comfortable, which is calling for that wall. Uh, John, I think the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, have to reconsider all tactics in dealing with the president in these situations, including not attending this meeting, simply putting their proposal on one piece of paper, releasing it publicly and saying, we know the president can't read more than one piece of paper. Here's our funding proposal. There's no re why go into a circus a discussion with a circus clown. The other is, if you are in a discussion with a circus clown in the Oval Office for the first time in history, I think the uh, what will be the Speaker of the House uh, and the Senate Minority Leader have to consider when they get up and leave. Yes. When they stand up and say, here's our proposal right here on one page for you, that's it, and leave. Once he goes into these crazy rants, the power of them walking out on him is a power that at some point they might want to exercise. I, I totally agree that all that, that a reconsideration of tactics is in order. I totally agree that a different kind of like counter theater, mm -hmm. you know, yes. is, is, is in order. And, and particularly because, again, to go back to the thing we've been talking about here, what, what was clear today is that although they may not have done everything they could have done to unnerve Donald mm -hmm. Trump, that they did unnerve him. Mm -hmm. What is clear is that psyops work with yes. Donald Trump, yeah. right? Yeah. He has a fragile psyche, a simple psyche, and easily to game out psyche, right? And so if, if this, in this meeting, which they came to with a relatively traditional approach, and they came to without a lot of uh, kind of uh, avant garde guard theatrics to, to play. But Just they, imagine they, what they could do yeah. if they went to avant-garde theatrics. And I want to put yeah. a cinematic button on the point that Ezra and you have both made related to Bob Mueller. What that moment was with Chuck Schumer right there <laughs> was the, the few good men moment. Yeah. It was yeah. the moment when Kathy, when, when Jack Nicholson finally says, you're damn right I ordered the right. code red. Right. And yeah. Kathy sits there and looks like, I can't believe he just admitted it right in front of yeah. me. That was Chuck Schumer's face. Yeah. He was Tom Cruise at that moment yeah. saying, I just got him. And then the sergeant at arms comes over and locks Jack Nicholson up. That's the moment we had today. And that's the moment you could have Listen, I, I think they the did. I think they did a fine job of improvising today. I think they have to now think beyond improvising. Yes. Think about their next meeting. When is their walkout moment? Uh, and and let it happen. Let Donald Trump be afraid of inviting them up there. Uh, John Heilman, Ezra Klein, Kimberly Atkins. Thank you for starting us off tonight. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on the button below for more from the Last Word and the rest of MSNBC.